Twenty years ago, a Boeing 747 crashed into an apartment block in the Belmer, Amsterdam. And this conversation between the pilots and the air traffic controllers is actually the only live footage we have of that crash. Officially, 43 people died, but according to the rumors, this number must have been much higher. And I can still remember that night. I was 13, and I was listening to the radio just before 7. And I could hear a reporter talk about rumors that there was something going on in the Belmer. But we had to wait until 8 o'clock to see the first moving images at the 8 o'clock NOS news um, because the reporter first had to bring the tape from Amsterdam to Hilversum. And they showed 10 seconds of flames, and that's all. And after that, the anchorman Gijs Wonders, he tried to contact the reporter in Amsterdam, but he didn't manage to do it because the phone line didn't work. And for 20 minutes he was struggling because he didn't receive any new information and he had not any information to share with his audience. A few days after the crash, this um, audio from the black box, box was aired for the first time. And in the days after the crash, rumors started to spread about men in white people, in white suits. And the Dutch newspaper, Algemeen Dagblad, told us that they flew in by a helicopter. And the Dutch newspaper, Trouw, told those, us that they were, were driving around in cars with French license plates. And there were also some rumors about health problems. And a lot of research has been done, but in the end we still don't know what those men were doing over there. Ten years later, and ten years ago, I was in the library of this university. I was studying for my exams, or at least I was trying to, and I just finished my journalism traineeship at the Dutch press agency AMP. And I was addicted to news, so I was checking the newswire every five minutes to see if something had happened. And that's where I first found out that a plane crashed into a tower in New York. And I can still remember that I stood up, and I was shocked that no one else stood up. And in a split second, I thought that no one had heard about the rumor, which was, of course, the truth. And I started to spread the rumor that there was something going on in New York with a plane and a tower, but nobody was interested because they just wanted to study for their exams. And then I ran home. I literally ran home. And my home was really nearby, and I was just in time to see the second plane hit the second tower. And it was for the first time that the world could witness a great disaster. And not only um, due to these technolo technological advantages, also the ethical dilemmas of a journalist increased. And I think you might remember this picture, the picture of the falling man. And we all watched people falling, falling down from towers. And did we really want to see those images? I'm not too sure. And that was one of the main complaints of readers as well as journalists the next day when a Dutch newspaper, the Volkskrant, published one of the pictures of the falling man. They complained that if they would have had the choice, they wouldn't like to see those pictures. And I had to think about these two events on the 21st of September. I was working on my laptop. And something that night made me think again of the Belmer disaster. There was no plane crash that day, luckily, but still there was some kind of a disaster. What should have been a great party ended up in riots. It was in Haren, a small village in the north of the Netherlands. And thousands of partygoers and rioters went there after they had seen a message on Facebook about a certain party. It's also known in the Netherlands as Project X Hare. And of course, impact-wise, 
This is not comparable to what happened in the Belmer or New York. But from a reporting view, it's still interesting to see what has happened over there. Because if you wanted to know what was happening in Hare that night, you didn't need any mainstream media anymore. You could just open your tweet deck, just like I did, and follow all the tweets and pictures of people who were in Hare. And even some of these civic journalists, they started to behave like mainstream media, just like these guys on the left. They started a live stream in the afternoon, just for fun, and they started to make a video and publish it online. But during the evening, the live streams of mainstream media like RTL and RTV Nord crashed, and his live, st live stream was the only live live stream. So in the end, he had more than one and a half million viewers that night. And in the Netherlands, that's really a lot. And what about the other one? An anonymous Twitter account, at Hare Life. Seven students without any journalistic experience decided to start a Twitter account at half past nine that night. And they started to Twitter based on other tweets, based on the messages of mainstream media, and based on WhatsApp messages of friends who were in Hare at that time. And within 97 tweets, and within three hours, they were able to attract almost 12,000 followers. And what's also really interesting to see that several mainstream media started to use this Twitter account as one of their resources. And ironically, the guy who published all the tweets, he was in Sweden at that time. So, according to me, this proves that right now, anyone can be a journalist. And even more interesting, anyone can have the same media impact as mainstream media. And while the, due to, while the technological advantages of mainstream media slowly disappear, guerrilla media types are able to tap in. And I would like to call this guerrilla journalism because both initiatives, they were gone after that night. But what about the trustworthiness of these new initiatives? During the night, there was a rumor about a dead girl and a dead boy. And at first, we all thought it was just a simple hoax. We're almost used to hoaxes. But as the rumors went on and on and on, guerrilla as well as mainstream media started to spread these rumors. They didn't dare to tell their audience that these, this girl and this boy actually died, but they dared to tell the audience about the rumors. And that has almost the same effect, actually. And both initiatives were waiting for the truth. And the truth could be told by Paul Houdanis who was the chief communication officer of the police that time. But Paul didn't know what to do, because he didn't really know what was going on in Hare, and he hadn't heard anything from his colleagues about a dead girl and a dead boy. But on the other hand, he could see all the tweets flowing around. So that's when he decided to um, neither disprove or approve the rumors. And what's really interesting to see is that, in the end, there was someone on Twitter who found the cause of the rumors, and it was a hoax. And the guerrilla media types were the first to disprove the rumors. So for one moment, it seemed that the guerrilla media were faster and even more accurate than mainstream media. But they had to struggle with another thing. What about all those pictures of the rioters? In the Netherlands, mainstream media are used to blur faces when people are suspected but not convicted yet. But during that night, hundreds of pictures of riots just went on and on on Twitter. And even people started to add names to these pictures. So that's why we could see what Bjorn was doing in Hare that night. So for mainstream media, it seemed a bit odd to blur the faces. And for me, this proves that ethical dilemmas like what to trust and what to publish or not are slowly taken out of the hands of a journalist and brought to the wishes of the viewer. 
They decide on what they believe and they decide on what they like to see. And I think that our generation will look for new gatekeepers, just like the live stream or just like the Twitter account. And um, our generation is able to do that. Our generation is able to decide whether they would like to trust a journalist, a friend, an unknown eyewitness, or even a computer. Because new technologies arise, like narrative science, a software tool which is able to make new stories based on large data sets without any human interference. They can even add a tone of voice to their news articles. And currently, new algorithms are being developed to decide what to trust or what not to trust. But who, in the end, would you trust? The programmer, the original content, or the final outcome? And what about developments like 3D environments? Immersive journalism, where it will be possible for people to enter the news event. So we will not only be able to see or watch the news, but we can actually take part of it. We can feel it. We can smell it. It's up to you if you would like to do that. And I can think of any events where you don't like to join. So in the end, it's all up to all of us what you would like to see or believe. And due to or thanks to new technology, technologies, we are all able to create our own new media landscape based on our own ethical beliefs, based on our own understandings, and based on our own interests. And that world could be different, your world could be different from mine. So that's why I would like to question yourself. In the future, what do you like your eyes to see? And what do you like to believe beside your own eyes? Thank you for your attention.